Here's what I can say. I understand human, what we call equilibrium behavior. That is what happens when the system is working normally. But the dynamics of social change are a total mystery. Yeah. Societies are complex, nonlinear systems, and we don't understand how they change. So people come along, so this is the future. This is what's going to happen in the future. Well, if they say the sun's going to come up tomorrow, I'll believe that. But if they mm. say what's going to happen to our values, to our social organization, etc., I say, I don't believe that. I'm not even going to read it. I don't care what you say. All I know is I'm going to fight for a good society. Mm. If I lose, well, gave a good fight. I'm Ron Jor, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Dr. Herbert Gintis is an American economist, behavioral scientist, and educator. Known for his theoretical contributions to social biology, especially altruism, cooperations, epistemic game theory, gene culture coevolution, efficiency wages, strong reciprocity, and human capital theory. He's currently external professor at the Santa Fe Institute and carries a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Throughout his career, He has worked extensively with economist Samuel Bowles. Their most recent book, A Cooperative Species, Human Reciprocity and Its Evolution, was published by Princeton University Press in 2011. In this conversation, we talk about why pandemics change everything, why people have entangled minds and what this means for fighting misinformation, why conspiracy theories operate like religions, Growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia as a curious and science-minded kid, the five powers of human beings, his journey through math, economics, the social sciences, and sandal making, the risks of becoming a single discipline thinker, the contradictory models of human behavior in the humanities. Why people vote despite the fact that their individual vote doesn't determine the outcome. His model of social rationality. What does it mean to be conscious? The explanation of altruism as a phenomena and many, many other topics. Herbert is a remarkably prolific researcher, writer, and thinker. And this conversation is packed to the brim with insights and fascinating questions. It's one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, designers, makers, authors, entrepreneurs, and impact investors who are working to change our world for the better. So follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe so you don't miss them. And now let's jump right in with Dr. Herbert Gintis. All right. I'm sitting here across the screen from Herbert Gintis. Herbert, welcome to the podcast. It's nice to be here. So usually these days we start with the COVID situation and like a quick check-in on what was your experience like? Uh, where were you based? How did it affect you and your work? Yes, um, it was absolutely horrible. First mm. of all, my wife was diagnosed with a lymphoma. And we have a place in New York, in Brooklyn, right across from the East River. It's really very beautiful. So we stayed there while she was being treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Don't do chemo unless you have to, because it's absolutely horrible. And in mm. the middle of it, all of a sudden, blam, we have this COVID-19 epidemic. Where is it centered? New York City. Mm. Where are we? New York City. It was like every day was a horror for six months. And wow. we're elderly, so, you know, we're very immune sensitive. So, yeah, it was pretty horrible. But I learned an incredible amount. I wish I were young again because I would start my career with such mm. great information about how human beings learn, why they believe what they believe, how they could be so sure of things when other people are equally sure of different things. 
the yeah. relation between morality and public service and individual self-interest. COVID-19 is the best thing. I mean, I'm being facetious, of course. Yeah. It's the best thing that ever happened to researchers trying to understand human behavior. So that's my situation. We did get through it, and we're both still alive. And I'm talking to you from Massachusetts, where our home is. Yeah. So that's the story. It's good to hear. Yeah, it seems like not many people had good experiences, though I guess some people actually used it to reflect and reconnect with themselves, walk in nature. Oh, a lot of people have done that. I read the paper every day in the United States. The labor market has changed radically since the pandemic. People care more about the quality of their work. The labor market is incredibly tight. And uh, I read in the paper today, I'm not sure it's true, I'll have to think about it. Pandemics change everything. Going back to the 13th century, mm -hmm. you might not believe this, but the 13th century had major pandemics that destroyed the emergent states for two centuries until the 15th century, 16th century. So these are really important events. And even in the worst of times, if you study human behavior, you got a lot of it here. Yeah, for sure. I was finding myself really surprised by how people I knew and thought were reasonable people got deeper and deeper into some rabbit hole and became anti-vaccine. And it's so hard to get through to them. If we want to just start what I do, the last book that I did was called Individuality and Entanglement on the Moral Basis of Human Behavior. Now, the basic, this is a whole book, but the basic message is human beings have, they don't have individual minds. They have entangled minds. People mm -hmm. are entangled with other people through the media, through friends and family, and they form networked minds with distributed information. The, what I know is distributed across the minds that I am entangled with. Mm. And I can believe very strongly in something because everybody I'm untangled with believes it very strongly. And I want to tell you something. I have not met a single Trump supporter in my life. Now, I'm older. I'm sure if my parents were alive, maybe they would have supported Trump. I do not know. But mm. I have never in my life had anyone say, I support Donald Trump. Yes. Now, if you ask Trump supporters, was the election stolen? They say, Oh, yeah. Everybody I know voted for Trump. Nobody right. voted for that old guy. <laughs> we have networked minds and distributed cognition. That is, our, what we know and what we believe is distributed across these minds. Mm. Now, I'm a scientist, so most of what I believe, I can confidently say there's nothing about the world that I believe in without evidence. If you ask me, you say X, Y, Z, I say, well, show me the evidence for that. Now, other people, they don't even talk about evidence. You know, they talk about they were depressed, they lost their job, and then they read this on the news, and then they saw the social yeah. media evidence. Well, look at all the people who believe in religion. I'll tell you right, right now, I'm very spiritual, but I think religion is mostly a bunch of crap, a bunch of be eat this, and pray this way, and go yeah. on Sunday or Saturday. I think I've always been religion blind. Now, spirituality is a different story. But religion is that. I mean, I have friends. They're fundamentalist Jews. They send me books about what happened 4,000 years ago someplace across the ocean. And I say, well, I don't really care about that. There's lots of other things happen, too. Who cares? Right. So I think the religious impulse of humans, which is universal. If you say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in spirituality. I don't believe in religion or all that. Well, maybe you don't, but I don't believe in dance. Dance is silly. You shouldn't be dancing around. You're wasting your calories. Right. So religion is a very real human behavior, and I respect it for that, even though it leaves me completely cold. But if you believe, if so many millions of people can believe in this guy in a white shirt with a long beard telling everybody what to do or something, then you can believe in these conspiracy theories. Yeah. It's the same thing. You don't ask, what's your evidence that God exists? If you ask people, does God exist? They say, sure. Well, what's your evidence? Well, what do you mean? I go to church every Sunday. Or Saturday, what have you? I go to synagogue. That's what it means to say God exists. It means I go to church. I go to synagogue. Right. It doesn't mean some ontological thing about the existence in the physical world of some entity, because they don't know what you're talking about. If you talk that way, that's not normal human behavior, you know. At any mm. rate, let's go on. 
No, that's really interesting. I, I feel like in a certain way, I'm like that too, except that I know a lot of scientists and doctors. And so, you know, when I talk to people who don't believe uh, in this stuff, who don't believe in a vaccine or don't take COVID seriously, it was like, talk to your doctor friends. They don't have any. Talk to your scientist friends. They don't have any. But you and see so, what I'm saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, that's entanglement. You're differentially entangled with different groups. And the science is hard, too, by the way, and it's unnatural. It's mm. unnatural to ask, what's your evidence for the existence of God? That's a crazy thing to say. It's like saying, why do you eat food? What do you eat it for? You know, blah, blah. Right. So we like to start with the person and move on to these topics. So I have this opening question that I usually ask, which is, what's something you learned early in life that and maybe in childhood that still drives you today, that is still behind what you hold today? I don't know why I have always been very drawn to science, but I have... When I was a kid, when I was 10 years old in Philadelphia, I grew up in Philadelphia or the suburbs, I would go on Saturday morning to the Franklin Institute to the library and take out books on science and math. I had an infinite amount of curiosity, and that's what has motivated me my whole life, just curiosity. I don't know what, how the world works, but I sure as hell care how it works, and I want to find out how it works. And don't give me some false answers that make you happy. Don't give me answers to make you happy. Just find the truth, you know. And by the way, I've studied not only physics and math, but all the behavioral sciences. Psychology, economics, I have a PhD in economics, sociology, anthropology, and political science. And I've actually published in top journals in all of these fields. Hmm. Why did I study all of them? Because you have to know them all if you want to understand society. I've always been motivated by curiosity and a curiosity about everything. So that's really what it is. Yeah. And not look for easy answers. Do you remember how this mindset started? No, I'm probably reading science fiction books when I was 10. I don't know. I didn't even know I was doing it. You know, I just did it. I studied algebra when I was in like fourth grade. Mm. I went to the library and got books on it. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. In my science class in sixth grade, I had this teacher, I don't remember his name, but on an exam, he said, what is electricity? And I used, I put in a formula, E equals IR. He went bananas. He said, what is this formula? I didn't teach you this formula. You're an insolent son of a gun. You go right <laughs> a thousand times. I will do what the teacher tells me to. And I was like, that's the formula, you know. I only had one teacher in, high, in junior high who promoted the way I thought, and he did. His name was Mr. Getty. This was Lower Marion High School. That's where Kobe Bryant went to high school. Mm. And he saw some what I was trying to think about, and he said, listen, come in after school, and I'm going to give you some money, and you can do a bunch of science experiments. So every day after school, and he did give me, and I, I built an oscilloscope and a high-fed amplifier, and I, I learned <laughs> words like hetero, dyne, radio, and stuff. So he was the only teacher who ever really pushed me in that mm. way, but in a very strong way. Yeah. So, you know, curiosity is really the basis for it. And there's no reason for it. Why are you why you are? You are who you are. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. See, so you started by studying math. Right? In your undergrad. Yeah. So what drew you to math specifically at that time? Oh, man, I loved math. You know, I was reading a book the other day. I, I'm, I'm writing a book now called Mathematics for Humanists. And in the nice. preface, I, I note this. I said, this is not easy. I'm not saying you're dumb. It's very hard. If you want to understand this, it's going to be very hard. But it's not going to be rote learning. You're not going to mm. just learn how to solve a problem and all that. And someone wrote in an email, said, the reason people hate math is, is these stupid problems. And I wrote back and said, I loved these problems. When I was in grade school, I loved to solve problems. When I learned trigonometry, you know, yeah. and I learned that cosine 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cosine theta and prove it, I thought, Jesus. when I read about Descartes and how he invented the Cartesian coordinates, mm. I was stunned that there's a circle. And there's an equation, and the equation relates to the circle. That is fantastic. Yeah. And I remember feeling just so overwhelmed. And then one time, I remember when I was about five, I was sitting on the floor, 
my father and my grandfather were talking, and my father said something like, well, I have to go to Binghamton. And my grandfather said, how long will it take? Well, I can go 60 miles an hour, and therefore it will take me so many hours. I thought, speed is related to time? Is related to distance? How could so different things, you know, be related to each other? Yeah. Right. Of course, they're completely trivially related to each other. But so yeah. I've been mostly stunned and overwhelmed by just mathematical facts and, and physical facts. I always studied physics. Yeah, that could be the seed of a kind of spirituality, this sort of amazement at the world. It's how a lot of people. Experience. Well, I know I don't compare myself to Albert Einstein, but I have exactly his take on spirituality, which is. People ask me, what are you doing? I say, I'm trying to find the face of God in the universe. Mm. And that's something that Einstein said. He talks about God is crafty, but he's not malicious. Constant talk about God. But what kind of God? You can read about it, by the way. He said, well, I don't mean a personal God who, you know, you pray to and then he gives you a lottery ticket or something like that. I mean that there's something out there that is spiritual, and I'm trying to find it by looking at the physical universe. Yeah. And that really hit me. When I got older and I, I was in graduate school writing my PhD dissertation, I made the, and I was, it was on human behavior. And I made the statement that the human beings have powers and there are five basic powers. There's mm -hmm. physical power, there's cognitive power, that is thinking. There's affective power, that is emotional. There is aesthetic power, which is art and music, mm -hmm. et cetera. And there is spiritual power. So these are powers we have. And the reason religion is so successful is because we have a spiritual power, but it gets corrupted and co-opted by these crazy, stupid things about what you eat and what you wear and go kill everybody who doesn't agree with you. So I always believed that spirituality was important because when I was a kid, I felt the spiritual. You know, I was a Jewish kid. I got bar mitzvah, and mm. I went to shul every Saturday. And I swear to God, that was a great experience. I experienced really? spirituality through that. I mean, just riveted through my heart, praying. But then I gave it up. I can rivet my heart without praying. So at any rate, I've always thought that these things are very important. In fact, what I argued when I was in graduate school, my PhD dissertation, is that human welfare depends on how well you've developed these five capacities. And inequality, which I've always been very upset of fact that some people just don't have a lot of opportunity. I mean, a lot. Right. is that they don't have a chance to develop their powers. Because if you have a chance to develop all your powers, then you're going to be a fulfilled person. I don't want to say happy. You could be a depressed mm. person, but you'll be a fulfilled person. So that's why I've always been so interested in inequality. I mean, I think it's terrible if people can't develop their personal powers, including spiritual. Yeah. No, I think that's a very powerful way of thinking about inequality. So you started in math and then moved to economics during your PhD. Do you want to tell us about that uh, transition? Oh, there's lots of fun stories about that. I was ambivalent about math because I really was interested in psychoanalysis. I mean, I'm a young man, all the hormonal urges and everything. Freud sounded fabulous, you know, and I'd read all Theodore Reich and all of these psychoanalysts and go, boy, these are all these urges we have, the id and the psycho and the superego mm. and all that. And I really wanted to do that. And my math professor said, you crazy? This is bull crap. This is nothing. It's not science. It's just talk. So it was hard for me to stay in math, but I did. And when I got out, it was because I was in SDS, which was the kind of radical student movement, anti-war, feminist, civil rights, and all that. And I was on the SDS board in the Harvard strike of 1969. And they fired me. I was a first-year professor, and they fired mm. me. But I got reinstated at any rate. So I felt very weird going every day into my little cubble and studying Grotendieck's um, algebraic topology. I'm sorry, algebraic geometry. And mm. then going out and going into Roxbury, Massachusetts, and agitating for social change. So I went up to a friend of mine, and I knew no economics. I mean, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know what income was. I knew what income tax was because my dad would always say, God damn, income tax. But I never knew what income was. Hmm. Knew nothing about it. But I had a friend who was studying economics at MIT. I was at Harvard. And he said, listen, maybe you should do economics. I said, what's that? I said, well, it's, if you could be a Marxist. See, Marxists say that economics determines everything. I said, okay, I'll try it out. 
I was working as a sandal maker in Harvard Square at the time, <laughs> making a living right next to the Brattle Street Theater and you know, making shoes for people and handbags and stuff. Cool. And I took time off at lunch. I told my employees there, hey, take over, I'm going away. And I went right over to the economics department, the Towers Hall. It was the middle of the summer, so nobody was there except one guy named James Duesenberry, who's a very famous economist. And I went mm. in and I said, I want to study economics. He said, why? I said, well, because economics determines everything. And he said, oh, I see. Yes. Then he looked at my transcript. So I was a math student at Harvard, which is mm. big deal. It is a big deal. So we'll turn this guy around. We'll become a good economist. That's right. how I became an economist. At first, I wouldn't even tell people. I said, what do you do for a living? Oh, I make sandals. You know? but after, about <laughs> after about two years, I thought, oh, I really love economics. This is fantastic stuff. So, you know, I got socialized into being a good economist. Most of my colleagues in the economics department thought I was a raving communist radical because I was opposed to the war in Vietnam. So what was your journey like with Marxism at this time? Did you stick with it or did they were they able to tame you? Well, they weren't able to tame me at all. Sure. <laughs> Not at all. But Marxism, I didn't know anything about social theory. And they said, look, if you're against the war in Vietnam, you must be a Marxist. I said, I would say, oh, sure. And I got a little book, a little book from the bookstore called Marxism. I went, oh, that's right, the working class, blah, blah, you know, dialectical materials, all obviously correct, you know. And from there, it was downhill. So I was a good Marxist for a while. But the problem with Marxism is this is not true. It, it makes lots of mistakes, but Marx himself was really brilliant because, and here's a major point for me, he did not have a discipline. He wasn't a historian. He wasn't an economist. He wasn't a sociologist. He mm. was a deep thinker. And he combined mm -hmm. everything together. And that's what I learned from him. Don't be a disciplinarian. Don't be in a discipline. You can call me an economist, but I know just as much sociology as I do economics and just as much biology as I do sociology, etc. I learned that yeah. from Marx. So Marx was wrong about a lot of stuff. And in particular, you know, my moral hero of the day was not Karl Marx with his uh, anti-democracy stuff. It was John Stuart Mill. I love John Stuart Mill mm. because On Liberty is one of the great documents ever produced by human beings. And Mill himself was iconoclastic. He was a feminist. He believed in democratic workplaces. He was a marvelous person. But I still was a Marxist for a while, and then I gave it up when it didn't work anymore. Yeah. So you were mentioning Marx as an interdisciplinarian, and, and I know one of your big, I don't want to say pet peeves, but one of your big projects is criticizing these separate models of, of human behavior from all right. of these different fields. So, yeah, tell me more about that and, and what's wrong with the existing or the prevalent model. You know, you always hear about the elephant in the living room. This is a prime case. Look, economics. When I learned economics, human behavior is selfish. People do what's best for themselves. They maximize their personal welfare utility. Hmm. Sociology, when I started, started that, they don't even talk about that. They talk about morality. People do what they think is right, and then bad people don't do it. So they're the bad people, don't do the right thing, you know. Two disciplines, they're not in the same building in Harvard, hmm. but they're, you know, I can walk over for, for lunch to the other one in about five minutes. And how could they not fight it out? How could they, right. not, how could these two disciplines go on and on with totally different ideas about how, what motivates human beings? Now, what I found out was they're both right and they're both wrong. And then I studied psychology and behavioral psychology. And a lot of psychology, you know, is very interesting. It's not about behavior. It's about dysfunctionality or vision or senses, etc. And there I learned what economists believe about self is completely wrong. People are not rational at all. They're irrational. Ten years ago, I read, I, got, I ordered from Amazon all of the major graduate textbooks in the introductory psych. And they all say the rational actor model, people, it's really wrong. People aren't logical, they're psychological. Well, that's ridiculous. And I'm very critical of behavioral psychology because they don't use the rational actor model. People are mm. rational. They make decisions. They try to achieve certain goals. And if you don't take that into consideration, you're making a very bad mistake. Being rational doesn't mean you have to be self-interested. Of course, you don't have to be self-interested. I'm not self-interested. 
Mm. You don't even probably know anybody who's self-interest except your grandfather or something. I don't know. I never met your grandfather. But the other thing is, people say, well, people make decisions and they're hurtful, like they smoke cigarettes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's what we have to understand. Rationality doesn't mean you choose the right thing. What do you think is the right thing? It means that you try to get what you want. If you need cigarettes, you go out and you buy cigarettes. And if you can't buy them, you steal them. Now, right. you're hurting yourself, but I can describe your behavior using standard mathematical notions of rational choice. That's the story. Now, political science, I, I would say, and anthropology, by the way, I study anthropology extensively and published in anthropology journals. Now, here's the problem. Why is anthropology different from sociology? They both study human behavior. Yeah. Now, so one is with primitive societies or so-called simple societies. And the other is more complex societies. Well, that's a hell of a difference. That's no difference at all. Right. They'd be totally different things. That's crazy. What's really going on here? Well, that's what motivated me about it. Now, political science, here you have a, a very more mature discipline, but theoretically really screwed up. There's no real political theory in general. It's just a bunch of ad hoc descriptions of this and that. But look at a simple problem. Why do I vote? Why do I vote? I've done this. I stand in line, you know, here in Northampton, Massachusetts. So the guy, why are you voting? He says, well, I want this guy to win the election. You say, oh, really? But you're just one vote. Do you think if one vote's going to change the election? I mean, and, and by the way, let me get a little technical for a bit. If you look at all the elections in English-speaking countries in the past 200 years, with more than 40,000 voters, no one vote has ever made a difference. Right. Ever. Right. And it never will. Well, maybe it will if we live another million years, billion years. Never right. made a difference. So how can you say that you make a difference? You didn't make any difference at all. You could have voted for the other guy and it wouldn't have made any difference. So what right. are you doing voting for this guy and telling me it makes a difference? And he said, well, it doesn't make a difference. One per. But if everybody thought that way, then we couldn't have democracy. And that is a deep statement. That drove mm. me to Kant, Immanuel Kant, the categorical imperative. I don't do something because it makes a difference. I do it because it's the right thing to do. Because mm. everybody should do this thing. Good people should do this thing. So I do this thing. And this right. is all basis of human morality. People criticize Kant a lot. And I did too. I, even in print, when I was young, I thought Kant was stupid for reasons I won't go into. Hmm. But Kant helps us understand human morality in a very deep way. Yeah. So political science, they go on and on, but they don't have a theory of categorical imperatives. They never mention it. They just assume individuals vote their self-interest. Hmm. In my last book, I noted if everybody voted their self-interest, they wouldn't vote at all. Right. If all you say, well, you know, I could stay home and have a second cup of coffee. Well, that makes a difference. Yeah, you got your second cup of coffee. If you go and vote, made no difference. Correct. To understand political theory. And by the way, why was Marx wrong? One of Marx's famous statements was, workers of the world unite. You know, why would they do that? Why would any individual worker unite with any other individual worker? Might mm. as well stay home and have your second cup of coffee. It's because human beings are socially rational. They have a social rationality, which I try to develop in this book to some extent, although not as much as I would have liked to. So all of these fields have something to offer and understand the human behavior, but they also make terrible mistakes. And it's interesting because they're very smart people. You know, they spend all their days reading all these damn books and, uh, you know, writing these damn articles. But they yeah. all have these incredible blind spots, which is they don't see these basic problems. Like, how could you say people are self-interested economists? Well, we know they don't even do that anymore. Because mm -hmm. behavioral economics, which I've been part of, has really blown open this idea that people act out of self-interest only. Self-interest is very important, obviously. But the real thing is to figure out how self-interest and um, morality and the other regarding interests fit together to make humans what they are. I wrote one book with my long-term colleague, Samuel Bowles, called A Cooperative Species, mm. which is human beings are successful because they cooperate. Also right. because they compete. They do both. All this stuff about, oh, the left says believes in cooperation, the right believes in competition. What crap. you got to have both. 
What do you think goes on in a football team? They cooperate in competing with the other guy. What goes on in a corporation? People learn to cooperate with each other to compete with another corporation or a foreign corporation. So these things fit together. And that's the same thing with human morality, which is humans are not goody goodies and they're not baddie baddies. They're incredibly complex combinations of both. Hmm. And understanding that is really hard. Yeah. So, so this leads me to kind of a devil's advocate question of why try to model humans? Can it even be done? Aren't our brain too complex to actually model? Aren't we all just too different as individuals? Well, the answer to that, I think, is absolutely not, obviously. I wouldn't be doing it if I thought that were true. Of right. course, humans are incredibly complex. I don't claim to understand. I don't understand consciousness, but maybe we'll get to that later. That's what mm. I've been studying for the past six years. What mm. does it mean to be conscious? Nobody knows, but human beings are incredibly alike across the world. Okay, this is, again, anthropology maybe, but you can go to any country You'll find differences somewhere, little schmatas on the head, and some don't, and some eat this and some eat that. But it takes you no time. They have marriages, they have divorces, they have jealousies, they have morality, they have hospitality, they have all these things in every country. There's a, a famous book on that says that, you know, that it's just basically there's a human nature. And it manifests itself in human beings behaving very much alike. Now, people go crazy and say, oh, yes, but women are oppressed in Afghanistan more than in the U.S. I say, well, yeah, that's a difference. Right. That's a difference. But it's one difference out of thousands of things that are the same. You go into a restaurant in Afghanistan, it's like going into a restaurant in New York City. It's not different. And marriages and divorces and, uh, you know, entanglement, love nests and all that, they're all the same all over the world. Just like ducks have a nature. They go quack. Mm. They have web feed. They swim in the little ponds. All of them, mm. except a few. Human beings are like ducks. We have a nature. Right. And wherever we are, we build a society that is compatible with that nature. For instance, human beings love their children. Okay? Not every species, but I don't even know what love means in some, but most, like, uh, you know, you, you, you lay a bunch of eggs and you go away. It was right. really hard to lay the eggs. And you had to put worms in the nest with the eggs so when they hatched, they had something to eat. And then you die. But right. you don't have any love for your kids. You never even see your kids. Mm. So every kind of species has its own nature. And human beings are no different. And it's just a scientific obvious fact. We have a common gene pool. I call it the human genome chapter in my last book and also an article in, in a biology journal, mm. Theoretical Biology. We have a genome, which is almost the same for everybody. There are little differences, right. but they're very little. I, I believe there's a lot of human difference in individuals, but that's mm. like saying in physics, we have a gas. It's got a lot of molecules. How can you say what's going to happen? Each one can do almost anything. Say, well, but there's statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, and you can see that there are regularities that come out of all of these individual differences. And right. that's what we want to study, how these regularities emerge and what they are, etc. Right. So like when I said something like human beings don't have individual preferences, they have distributed cognition over a network of minds. That's a general statement, which I would say is true or false. It's true or false of every society. And I think it's true of every mm. society. So, yeah. yes, you can say a lot. Now, of course, individuals are going to diverge from that the same way as an atom in a gas is going to go rocketing off in some crazy direction for just random reasons. You wrote a lot to explain altruism and like non-self-interested behavior. So I'd love to hear where, where do you land on this question today? You know, what's the most complete model of explaining how we actually make decisions? Well, it's economists love to make trade-offs. There's trade-offs. First of all, I don't like the term very much self-interested hmm. because you can be self-interested and be altruistic. It makes me happy. I love to see you eat a steak dinner. It right. makes me happy. So I'm self-interested in giving you a steak dinner. Or I feel terrible when someone kills a whale. So I want to stop killing whales. I want to give money to save the whales. That's right. self-interest. And human beings are inherently moral. That's mm. a major point. And I don't mean they're good moral or bad moral. They're just moral. That is, they do things that are not just going into an orifice of their body. They hate They love. Mm. 
They take revenge and vindication. They um, are expansive and give away things to others. I went out on the porch today, this morning, to get the newspapers. They were on the porch rather than being in the street where they usually are. Someone came by with her walking their dog, said, hey, I'm going to put this guy's papers on the porch where it's easier for him to find them. Nice. Now, why? He didn't say who they were. They didn't take a picture of it and put it on Instagram. And this happens all the time. You go to an airport, ask somebody for directions. They stop and they tell you if they can. They're not going to see you again. That's morality. And on the other hand, people can vengeance. This is a very important point. If you read the sociology textbooks, things like vengeance and vindication and retaliation and all that, they're considered to be pathological behaviors. Hmm. But they're not. Two things about humans. They love and they like to take revenge. And there are two types of movies. They're love movies and they're revenge movies. Revenge movies like Arnold Schwarzenegger's nice little family is broken up by some bad people and they kill the dog and kill the wife. And the rest of the movie is he's killing everybody in sight. And when it's over, people say, that was a really fine movie. They're very well done, you know. People love to watch the bad guys get hurt. And they love to hurt them at a cost to themselves. Mm. Okay? At a cost to themselves. This is what we study in the laboratory and in the field. It's called strong reciprocity. We like to help people who are nice. We like to hurt people who are nasty. That's a major thing that is shared all across the world. There's no society, at least that I've ever heard of, in which that behavior is not manifested. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. So I've heard you speak about the inclusive self-interest as one model that's been used to explain behavior. And then you come in with this entangled minds plus some sort of morality. So how do we then, you know, if I have to project how people will largely behave in a certain situation, what are some of the tools that I can use to start? There, the two basic tools are the rational actor model, which is a theory of choice. It's highly mathematical, but common sense. It's, it basically comes down to this. If you're rational, it means that if you prefer A to B and you prefer B to C, then you prefer A to C. It's called mm. transitivity. If you don't do that, well, I can't tell you what you're going to do. You're not making choices based on any principle. But if right. you just have that and make one or two little side things, then you can describe people as maximizing some function. And it's called the, we call it the utility function, but it doesn't, it's just a mathematical convenience. And that's the first tool. And the second tool is called game theory. Mm. Now, game theory is as follows. It's each individual is a rational actor, and they each have a set of possible strategies that they can use. And each individual makes a choice of a strategy, and then the game determines what the outcome is, the payoff to each person. That's what game theory is in general. Can I give you an example? Sure. Okay, this is an interesting example. It's called the ultimatum game. There are two players. They never see each other, ever. They're in different rooms. Player one is called proposer. Player two is called respondent. Experimenter comes in the room and says to the proposer, here's $10, or it could be $100 or $1,000. Here's $10. I'm telling the other guy, the respondent, that I gave you $10. You can mm. offer any amount from 1 to 10 to this guy. If he accepts it, you split it the way you decided. If he rejects it, you both get nothing. Okay, so there are two players. They each have two choices, reject or accept. The first guy is offer the X amount or Y amount or Z amount. The second one is reject anything below a certain amount or accept anything above a certain amount. And the payoffs are as I described. Now, how would you say people would behave in this game? 
Well, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you say, oh, the proposer will assume the respondent is self-interested and he'll offer him one dollar. Mm. And the respondent says, well, one's better than zero, so I'll accept a dollar. Okay, right. never has that happened. We have played that game thousands of times. And in one, we did it coordinated in 15 small-scale societies around the world. Hunter-gatherer societies, transhuman agriculture, Mongolian herders, all over the world. Nothing has ever come any like that. The usual offer, the median, median offer is five, and it's mm. accepted. And in most places, if you offer less than three, you're going to get rejected. Mm. And if you ask people, why did you reject $3? You could have had $3 because it wasn't fair. Mm. He's getting $7. I'm not going to go for that. Right. Now, is that irrational? No, it's not irrational. It's not selfish. It's other regarding, we call it. That is, you mm. care something about the other guy. Now, you may say, well, that's $10 is not a lot of money. So let's try it in Indonesia with farmers, and let's make it $300, which is a month's salary. How much do we make in a month? Mm. No, they reject anything below $120. Wow. Yeah. Okay, they'll reject it. So this is a universal behavior of humans. Now, there are big differences. There are societies that are so cooperative that some people offer more than half. They'll offer $7 to the other guy, and believe it or not, the other guy can reject it. Why does he reject $7? Because it's not fair. It's too much. Or yeah. another argument is, well, he came into some money. He thinks he's a big shot. He's going to give me a lot of money. Well, I'll show mm -hmm. him. So these are very behaviors, but they all fall under a category of other regarding preferences and social norms. When I first heard the word social norms, I thought, oh, that's bull crap. I heard social norms, you know. Mm -hmm. But what we learned from our small scale society study which ended up being a book called, oh, I forget the name, it's 15 Small Scale Societies, I believe, mm. Oxford. When I got the data in, I was flabbergasted because here's this generalization. People take their values into the laboratory under anonymity when no one will ever find out what they do. They take the same values into the laboratory as they do in daily life where reputation effects are so important. This was a flabbergasting finding for me because mm. um, I didn't believe it. I had a big brow with uh, the great sociologist Talcott Parsons when I first started business as an academic. And I criticized him for that theory. So look what's going on. What's your social norms? Here we are. We're uh, demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. Did I learn that in school? Did my parents say demonstrate against the Vietnam War? No. So it's wrong to say social norms determine everything. Mm -hmm. And I was right. But social norms generally work, and they work in the way sociologists say they work generally. So, yeah. um, you know, yeah. So here's what games can do. Now, there are lots of games. They're social games. Here's another game. It's called the public goods game. There's six people. We're each given $10. You can keep any part of that or put some part of it into a common pool. The money in the common pool is tripled by the experimenter and then divided equally among the six players. Mm. So every dollar you put in gives everybody else three times as much altogether, $3 mm. altogether. But it costs you 50 cents or it costs you a certain amount because you're putting in the money. So right. if everybody is selfish, they won't put any money at all and they each get $10. Right. But if they're all completely other regarding, they all put the $10 in and they each get $40. Mm. See, so by cooperating, they all make off better. It's called public goods game. But each has an incentive not to cooperate. Now, how do you play this game? What happens when you play this game? Well, I, you know, it's very funny. When I started working on this, I would ask philosophers at a conference, what will happen? They didn't know. Mm. It was all over the place. But here's what really does happen in this game. People start out in the Western society, mostly. They start out by contributing about half. And if they contribute about half... This tends to go up for a while. Then it could be 60% and then 70%. But then people get pissed off because some people aren't putting in any money. Mm. So they retaliate against that by not putting in any money and the payoffs go down to zero. Right. It's called the unraveling of cooperation. If there mm. are bad guys running around, there don't have to be that many bad guys. There don't have to be that many. They can just unravel cooperation. So here's an alternative, which was developed by a wonderful economist named Ernst Fair at the, in Zurich. 
Public goods game with punishment. After each round, you can watch what everybody put in, and then you can pay money to hurt one, someone you put in money that you don't like. Mm. So I say, you put in two, I'm going to pay $2, and then they'll take off $4 from you. Mm. Okay? It starts out at 50%, goes right up to 99%. Right. 90%. And it stays there forever. Okay, why? So but this is how human society works. We punish each other for antisocial behavior. You don't have to go to a court of law for this. If you're a jerk, you don't have to get the state in there to put you in jail. Someone gives you a slap and they fire you or they don't like you. This is the main way the humans discipline each other for bad behavior at cost to themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is another non-self-interest behavior or non-selfish yeah. behavior. Yeah, so there's all sorts of games like this, and each of them gives you some insight. And by the way, there are differences. The public goods game, in advanced societies where there's a lot of cooperation, including China's big cities, people cooperate the way I said. Mm. In societies that have predatory states and are basically unruly, people don't cooperate at all. In fact, people punish cooperators. You look up in the board and say, this guy gave eight. Oh, I'm going to punish him. <laughs> He should have given that money to his relatives. He shouldn't mm. be giving money to this stranger he's never going to see. I believe in giving money to my relatives. It's mm. not that someone is, is socially minded and they're moral and the other one is, is they have different moralities. Mm. The advanced morality is when you meet a stranger, you treat him with great respect and love. And in unruly societies, you're suspicious of everybody. You have your tribe and you dislike everyone who isn't part of your tribe. So there are different ways of connecting to others through your entangled minds, see. But they're basically the same underlying morality. Yeah. So a lot of these things feel relevant now more than ever when we look at the, the current crisis that seems to be a current crisis in cooperation, collective action, and even agreeing on basic facts, right? Finding it very hard to get together around climate change around basic science like vaccines. And it seems to be the sense of increased polarization that maybe comes from the wrong kind of entanglement. We're all now in entangled in social media in a way that makes us dislike each other and react against each other. So what are some insights into, and I know this is a big question, but what are some insights that you can gain from what you know into how to make the situation better? Well, yeah, that's a good question. First of all, no matter what social change occurs, 30% of the population is not going to like it. Mm. And they're going to develop their alternatives and their conspiracies and their QAnons and all this stuff. It's happened over and over and over again, even during the 1918 pandemic. 30% of people said it didn't happen. It's God's will. I'm healthy. I feel great. You know, all mm. sorts of shit. So don't try to expect to get everybody on right. your side. You're not going to. There are two groups that are intransigent on opposite sides, and there's a large group in the middle, and they make a real difference. The reason I believe in science is because the people in the middle are, to some extent, susceptible to believing what the scientists say. Science has had a hard time in the United States. I don't know about other countries as much, but because the universities, sciences are done in universities mostly. And the universities in the United States have become dogmatically liberal. It's called cancel culture. If you don't agree with this you know, crap that the progressive left puts out, the authoritarian yeah. left, they want to get rid of you. And so the scientists are tainted by the ideology of the liberal universities. Now, I'm a liberal myself in the sense that I, as I've mentioned before, I'm a classic liberal, a John Stuart Mill type liberal. I believe in equality for everybody and feminist rights or human rights and all that stuff. But I'm mm. not one of these cancel culture people who think that there's this rote dialogue you have to use. And if you disagree with them, they don't care about the science at all. Oh, trans women are women. They're pure women. Well, they're not, I'm sorry to say. And so this attitude in the universities in the U.S. makes it possible for deniers to say, that's just their view. There's no evidence. It's not that there's no evidence. Evidence is irrelevant. That's their view. Mm. That's the main reason I'm so incredibly hostile to this cancel culture stuff. And I think there should be more conservatives in the universities, not because I'm a conservative, but because you have to hone your arguments against people who disagree with you. 
Right. And at, at any rate, you're never going to get more than 70% to agree with you about most things. Right. And that's what you have to fight for. And you have to fight for it by using evidence and by using science. And it's been so hard in the COVID because when this started out, we didn't know how it was transmitted. Mm. We did not know. I, I don't know how many months on end I washed every piece of groceries that came into the apartment. Yeah, because sure. We thought it was maybe contact and distance and mass. So it's very hard. But the science has come out, I think, pretty securely, along with the experience of different countries. Although even that, look at Israel. Israel has gone through some incredible uh, changes back and forth, and nobody really understands it, I think. So, mm. yeah. So I don't have anything about how we're going to convince everybody that this is right or wrong. I learned when I was a kid, fight for what you believe in. Mm. Fight for what you believe in. Don't tell me how it's going to work. It may not work, but fight what you believe in. It's all you can do. So I believe that about COVID. I had to deal with that in Northampton, Massachusetts. When it first came out, there's this app called Nextdoor where you talk to your neighbors. And one neighbor would say, oh, this mask stuff. If you want to wear a mask, that's fine. It's up to you. You shouldn't be angry at people who don't. It's their personal choice. And I wrote back, I said, yeah, my personal choice is to not like you, to think you're hurting people because you're not wearing a mask. That's my personal choice. Right. And then there's a back and forth about that. And yeah. most people, of course, here I am in Massachusetts, never having met a Trump supporter in my life that I knew of. And so I won that battle. So it's a battle. Now, yeah. I wouldn't take on battles that I don't think have any chance of winning. I think that's pretty stupid, waste of time. But you never can tell what's going to have a chance of winning. 20 years ago, if you'd say same-sex marriage is okay, gay, LBGQ, whatever, is great. I would mm. say, I believe that's true, but it's never going to happen. Mm. It happened big time. So here's what I can say. I understand human, what we call equilibrium behavior. That is what happens when the system is working normally. But the dynamics of social change are a total mystery. Yeah. Societies are complex, nonlinear systems, and we don't understand how they change. So people come along and say, this is the future. This is what's going to happen in the future. Well, if they say the sun's going to come up tomorrow, I'll believe that. But if they mm -hmm. say what's going to happen to our values, to our social organization, etc., I say, I don't believe that. I'm not even going to read it. I don't care what you say. All I know is I'm going to fight for a good society. If I lose, well, gave the good fight. Yeah. So that, that's my answer to your question. What do we do about these social issues? Climate yeah. change, good science, plus fight like hell for the right side. That's all. Yeah. What about, you wrote about individuality and entanglement and, you know, looking at what we're going through with the internet, we seem to be in some ways more entangled than ever before. Yeah. But it's producing some results that we don't like. It's producing conspiracy theories and disinformation. Yes. And so is there an insight there about good entanglement versus bad entanglement, a better form of entanglement, anything that we can think about to rethink how this sort of haphazard entanglement happened on the Internet and how we can do it better? Well, yeah, I mean, the simple fact is that technology has made it possible to have new types of entanglement that never existed before. For mm. instance, there's conspiracy theorists, but they couldn't talk to each other because there's one in every county. Right. Now they talk to each other, they reinforce each other, and uh, they make a new entanglement of crazy stuff. What can you do about it? Not much. So there are big differences. Facebook is not Apple. Mm. Facebook is not Amazon. I love Amazon. I mean, I love it with a vengeance. I buy books on it all the time, and I look at reviews of books on it all the time. Right. And Apple, I never liked Apple because they're so proprietary. When I was making computers years and years ago, my little lab, you know, with the soldering iron, mm -hmm. I hated Apple because you couldn't make anything for Apple. They were all proprietary. But they have escaped all of this bad stuff about how these big information machines are hurting people. So it's possible to do it. The question is legislation. I think it's legislation that does it. And you'll never eliminate it completely. Look at newspapers and also the judicial system. They mm. should be able to sue people who say stuff that's hurtful. And if it hurt, in fact hurts somebody, then they should be responsible for that. Or mm. at least the legal system should deal with that. So, you know, I think there are reforms that will take a hold and will work. Mm. Um, what's going on? Here's, here's what I think really going on. 
What's really going on is we're having very rapid social change away from traditional energy sources and traditional costs of movement. The energy sources give rise to the climate change problem. And of course, you know, it hurts coal regions and red regions and it helps blue regions. So that's going to cause a lot of problems until it's eventually one side wins or the other. And I think the blue side will win. The second is the tremendous increase in the life of the poor in the world. Hmm. I don't know if you've looked at it or not. People criticize globalization and, you know, how it's hurting the middle class. I'll tell you who it's helping. It's helping the poor all around the world in a way which could not have been foreseen. It's amazing. Poverty has been cut by 90 percent in a lot of places. China is the obvious. Hmm. And what does that mean? Well, when you cut poverty, you create immigration because the non-poor people want a better life. They don't want to be just lower middle class. They want a better life and they can pay for it. You know, these um, in the United States, if you look at the immigrants from Latin America, of South America and Central America, they pay a lot of money to the smugglers to get out of there. Right. And the poor people don't pay because they don't have the money. Poor people stay in Ecuador and Venezuela and where have you. But if you have a little bit of money... You end up at the border. So these are terrible problems. And and we didn't used to have these problems because there were so many poor that the lower middle class was emaciated in most Mm -hmm. countries and they couldn't emigrate. So so you have the societal changes, which in some sense are really good, but they have costs of change. Will it work out? Well, we don't know. We don't know whether it will work out. We could all destroy ourselves as a civilization or not. Mm -hmm. But these are growing pains. And you don't try to convince individuals. You work on empowering people who agree with you and getting people who are undecided on your side. That's, that's what I would say. Interesting. You said you've been working on the problems of physics and consciousness in the past few years. I'd love to hear what you're discovering. Yeah. First of all, what I discovered from studying behavioral sciences was that you can have misinformation generally agreed upon by all the experts in the field, even though it's wrong. And I gave you the example in economics, self-interest, which was beaten back by all these experiments we're doing. There's no question, but it's beaten back. Nobody makes the argument they used to make. And other fields like sociology, of course, your sociologists are going to be angry at me. I love sociology and I'm, I've studied it all my life, but I think the profession is now completely defunct of uh, theoretical continuity and stability. It's become a kind of liberal activist organization and people don't do theory. They just justify what they believe. And it's always this left wing stuff about how people of color and are hurt by white supremacy and what have you. I joined the A, what do you call it, ASA for several years, and it sounded like the old SDS that I used to belong to. It was very political. And they believe things which are just wrong, which, again, incentives don't matter. Give me a break. You can study sociology and never know that there are incentives. You can study economics and never know there's social norms. How is that possible? At any rate, that's what I learned from the behavioral sciences. People can believe some, like, for instance, in sociology, the idea of socialization and internalization of norms is so important. How could any discipline trying to understand human behavior not put those into the equation? Hmm. But they do. Economists don't. When I first used social norms in an article I published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, my best friends thought I was crazy. What is the social norms? So I had them read a bunch of stuff, and they agreed. They had never read this stuff, and they didn't believe this stuff, right? And this is general. Anti-vaxxers have never read this stuff, Mm. you know, on why vaccines work. Well, anyway, that is also true in physics. It's unbelievable. And here's the problem. Physics is a highly developed subject with lots of incredible successes, But there's so many fundamental issues that it has not been able to resolve. And what what do you do then? Okay, take quantum mechanics. Well, most people won't know it, but quantum mechanics is weird. And the more you learn about it, and I mean after years, the more you learn about it, the weirder it gets. So people try to say, here's how it's not weird. And then they create some crazy story like multiple worlds theory. Well, I know people, very fine physicists like Sean Carroll, who I did a podcast for recently. He believes in that. Is there any evidence for it? No, no, it just flows out of this equation. Is that equation true? This equation has what's called a Hamiltonian in it. Where do you get the Hamiltonian? Well, everything has a Hamiltonian. Every closed system has a Hamiltonian. Really? Does my brain have a Hamiltonian? 
How do you know every closed system has a Hamiltonian? You don't know that. It's not true. Mm. Probably not true. What are you going to determine my brain by burning it up and see what the spectral lines are? Come on. You think my computer has a, uh, a Hamiltonian? No, it doesn't have a Hamiltonian. It's a complex system with emergent properties. We don't really know how it works. But mm. it makes a lot of people happy. So we have one equation and we use it for everything. Why? Well, it works really well. Sure, it's like your key in your lock. Your key works in some lock. It doesn't work in every lock. It works in some lock. Mm. So yeah, my point here is that people try to create more satisfaction with what they know than uh, is warranted by the data. And the data on quantum mechanics is we do not know the so-called measurement problem. We do not know how to solve it. And you mm. can criticize people like Niels Bohr or von Neumann, who um, proposed the so-called collapse of the wave function. You can mm. criticize it, but your alternatives are just talk because you have no mm. evidence for any of it. So that's what I'm finding out about consciousness. The thing about consciousness is this. There's no such thing in physics. Right. It doesn't mean anything. You, you can look at all these equations. It's not there. But it right. is there in real life. So what do some people do? Oh, it really doesn't exist. Daniel Dennett, who I like a lot. I think he's a great philosopher. Says, oh, it's just mm. a mirage. You know, it's just, yeah, a mirage. Yeah. It doesn't really exist. He said, well, yeah, but it's the only thing I really know. Descartes was right about that. The only thing I really know is that I am conscious. You can call mm. what you want. If it's a mirage, whose mirage is it? It's my mirage, you know, right. et cetera. And then that's connected to the problem of free will. What does free will mean? Well, it means you could have done otherwise. But in physics, they tend to say everything is determined, at least this equation, so-called Schrodinger equation, etc. Things are determined, so you couldn't have done otherwise. What's going on here? To what extent does our knowledge of physics and its strengths, its true strengths, corrupt what we believe about these philosophical issues, consciousness and free will? That's what I've been doing lately. Mm, interesting. And I, I know that there's Dan Dennett, there's Sam Harris has his own uh, pretty vocal view on free will, and there's a lot of interesting work. Do you have any new approach? No. To... More, the more I study it, the more interesting and alive it gets, and the less I understand about it. I don't have an answer to it. No, not at all. But I do have a lot of critiques of other answers to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so... What can I say? I think that neuroscience may end up helping us, but it hasn't so far. For instance, when are we conscious? I've been unconscious. You know, I had a colonoscopy, and I was out, and then I was up. I was completely unconscious. It wasn't like a dream world. It was unconscious. But what causes it? You can stop consciousness, but we don't know where, where it is. It's in the brain somewhere, something of it. And it's a very deep issue because there are people who appear to be brain dead, but they may not be. They may be really experiencing everything in there. They just can't get it out. So mm. there's all sorts of things going on. And I can't believe that the neuroscience won't help us in the end with this issue. But uh, no, I mean, it's mostly people say consciousness explained and then they don't. Yeah. Have you looked at integrated information theory? Yeah, I don't think much of it. Well, the problem is, there's a lot of problems. One is simply that there's a lot of integrated information that we would never call conscious. There's a real difficulty. How do I know you're conscious? Well, yeah. you look like me, you know, I used to have a beard, you know, I wear glasses and I have polo shirts and this and that. And you say you're conscious, so why would you lie? Right. Right? But if I look at a rabbit, how do I know whether it's conscious or not? What do I say? Rabbit, are you conscious? Hmm. Where rabbits don't talk. Is there any way of figuring out something is conscious other than the way it talks? Well, there is one. Well, I don't even say that. Turing, the Turing test. The Turing test is something is conscious if you can't determine whether it's conscious or not by talking to it a lot of times. So if you're talking right. to a machine, there could be a man behind there or a woman, and you're talking to them laughing and this and that. Yeah, sure, it's conscious. No, it's just a machine. Is there any other way of doing it? No, that's a real problem. We don't have it. So they're panpsychists who believe that, you know, rocks are conscious or, you know, certainly amoeba are conscious. Boy, did you ask it? You know, mm. so when I was young, I learned don't ask questions you can't answer mm. because you'll never get tenure and you'll, you'll be out of a job. You'll run an <laughs> elevator or something in a department store. Don't mm. ask questions you can't answer. But when you get older and you've answered lots of questions, then you're allowed to ask questions you probably can't answer. 
That's yeah. what I'm doing now. Yeah. The measurement problem in quantum mechanics is real. It doesn't go away. It's not been solved by anybody. But, oh, I read in paper, Phil Anderson, my colleague at Santa Fe Institute, wrote a thing saying, oh, decoherence explains it. Well, I'm not going to go into decoherence, but it doesn't. Big mm. back and forth. It doesn't do anything like that. At any rate, people like, in a discipline, like to sew, out, sew up the loose ends. Yeah. And they'll grasp at straws to sew up the loose ends. But the loose ends is where all the new information lies. That's where you have to look for what's new and real. So that's what I'm doing. It's fun. Yeah. People ask me, why do you do what you do? I said, I'm curious. Yeah. That's why I do it now. Yeah. So as a closing question, we came up with in his TED Talk, philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. And he says a lecture is a kind of modern secular way to pass information. You know, you're just passing a little bit of information. The person makes up their own mind. It's kind of this dry way of talking. And a sermon is a more ancient, more religious, spiritual way. And it's there to kind of urgently try to change your life. Right. So if I gave you a stage for a little sermon for people who want to engage in this world, want to make a positive difference, you know, maybe in the beginning of their careers, What's one thing that really could change their life? Don't do identity politics. Don't do cancel culture. Don't do postmodernism. Do science. If you don't like to do science, then do something else with your life. Only do it if you like it, but do real stuff. And it's really fun if you do that, at least for me. But mm. if people ask me, should I do this or I do that? I usually say, do what makes you happy. What do you yeah. think you're going to change the world? If you decide not to become a horticulturist, is the, all the plants in the world going to die or something? No. Just do what you want to do. Hmm. It used to be people say you do what your parents told you to do. You know, you're going to be a lawyer. I don't like law. You want to be a lawyer anyway. That has passed. And I'm totally with the new idea, which is figure out what you like to do. Now, you do have to also make a living. For instance, my wife is a very successful artist. But she had lots of friends, so, you know, they wasted an awful lot of time not mm -hmm. making a living and living, you know, in bread crusts because they just couldn't make it. So you do mm -hmm. have to worry about that, and it's a big trade-off. And Napoleon was asked one time, how do you decide when to go into battle? And he said, on s'engage, puis on voit, which means you go into battle and you see what happens. <laughs> just make sure that you're willing to change what you're going to do if it doesn't work out. And certainly he did that. Mm. Although it didn't work out in the end very well for him, I must say. Read Tolstoy, War and Peace, if you really want to understand someone who hates Napoleon mm. with a vengeance. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Robert. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Same here. It was wonderful. Bye-bye. All right. That's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations, through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.